Okay, welcome everybody. It's the uh, top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. My name is Aida Awad. I'm uh, at Broward College in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, beautiful rainy Florida. Um, and I'm happy to welcome you to our NGSS Earth and Space Science webinar today entitled Integrating High School Earth and Space Science Classes into Chemistry Classes. Um, and before we get started, John, you want to back up just one uh, slide real quick? Just to make sure everybody's uh, doing well on the Zoom controls, down at the bottom of your screen, please keep your, uh, your microphone muted and your video muted. That has a red slash through it. Down there, you'll also see the ability to click on participants and chat. And there will be some links put into uh, chat along the way. So you might want to keep that chat box open. You can grab the top of it and move it around your screen and place it wherever it's easiest for you to see. No. no. Okay, go ahead to the next. Uh, actually, we'll skip up one more slide. Uh, on the webinar today, um, we're going to have Martin Schmidt, who will be telling us about his work related to integrating Earth and Space Science into chemistry courses. And then we will save about 10 minutes at the end for discussion. And also, we want to introduce you to some information about our threaded online discussion feature that will allow you to continue this conversation after the uh, the webinar is over and also to uh, view an archived version of the webinar head to the next slide perfect so this will be the last webinar of this webinar series the the 2017-2018 series we'll be taking the summer off as we typically do and we'll see you back in september please watch for a registration information for our September webinar um, in your inbox sometime the middle of the summer. And if you're interested in looking at our past webinars and all of our programming workshops, abstracts, etc., you can find those on our programming flyer. And uh, also, you can get onto the email list through the link shown there. And those are in the chat box. Thanks, John, for putting those in there. Okay, you want to go on to the next slide. So without any further ado, we're going to introduce you to Martin Schmidt, who is going to tell us about his work integrating high school earth and space science into chemistry courses. Martin, you all set? Uh, I think so. Let's Perfect. see if this comes up here. Uh, let's see on this one. Does that look okay? Looking good. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, hello to everyone. Thanks for uh, connecting with the webinar. Um, hope you'll find it's uh, worth your time. Um, we got uh, actually a whole lot of interesting things to cover about. To um, let's uh, so we'll get started on. Let's see what's the what uh, the really fascinating chemistry of the Earth. I have to start with kind of reminding everybody what does NGSS say. It says it's uh, not just biology, chemistry, physics anymore. It's really physical life and earth science. That means uh, we need all three of those in high school where it may or may not be, may or may not have earth science. Um, some folks are uh, putting in earth science uh, course in high school, uh, but if they're not, people are gonna have to integrate the performance expectations into uh, biology, chemistry, physics. And so um, we'll have to ask, is that, is that a problem? Well, maybe. But actually, uh, with a lot of problems, we can turn it into an opportunity. Um, there's a lot of very interesting and relevant earth chemistry to talk about. And so hopefully that's what we can uh, make it as an addition. There are a few hurdles to get over. Um, the chemistry teachers probably haven't seen very much of this material before. They didn't have much opportunity to. Um, so it'll be a, a lot of new content for them uh, often. Um, I've even heard some tell me they don't like earth science. That's why they uh, that's why they teach chemistry. So so we'll have to get over that. Um, another objection can be that oh the course is already full now and trying to squeeze some more in it is going to be really tough. Okay, we'll have to address that. And and it's quite understandable. These folks uh, see themselves as chemistry teachers. That's what they uh, may have been for uh, a long time. So so we have to help with all of those things. Um, there are some replies to that. Um, the NGS is the new standard. Um, we are asking people to do new approaches, uh, and so chemistry teachers will need to uh, add some earth science. Uh, hopefully we can get it enjoyable. Uh, we can also make time in the courses because really NGSS demands 
writing whole new courses and new curriculum, um, not just squeezing more into the old ones for a couple of reasons. Um, the standards themselves, to be honest, when I look at them, as a, I'm somebody who's taught chemistry before, and I think about all the things that have been in courses, uh, I find the, the HSPS1 PEs, there's only a few of them really, uh, and so uh, the standards are kind of light on chemistry. Um, it's not all the things that were in past courses. <clears throat> uh, also, uh, priorities have changed. The chemistry earth has really been left out for 100 years, um, and NGS says now it's time to correct that. So our new courses will, will include it. Um, <clears throat> so with that, you know, how do we approach it? Um, the idea, best idea is take all the things we know in earth science and uh, relate them to chemistry. So uh, everybody feels like they're still teaching a chemistry course. We're really uh, doing that. Um, connect the topics that have been in uh, past courses that uh, chemistry teachers are used to teaching. <clears throat> Keep on uh, um, broadening chemistry. See these uh, new topics as enhancements, really, making the chemistry course even better. Okay? And I hope that uh, some chemistry folks will look at some of this and say, uh, wow, this is really cool chemistry that we're seeing um, it, it, as a neat addition. So you kind of get the thread here. We always need to get the Earth Science Chemistry Association so that people really see that it is uh, chemistry uh, that they're getting. Um, and by the way, uh, folks out there who are teaching geology or geoscience courses, um, I hope this kind of brings up a few things of uh, chemistry connections to that that also add to the geoscience courses. Hopefully that'll, that'll go both ways. In this presentation, what I'm gonna do is concentrate on a lot of the content. The uh, school systems are creating their own approaches for things that fit with exactly their situation. So I'm gonna let them handle most of that. Um, but uh, I will include from NGSS the performance expectations. Um, also be trying to talk about phenomena that we can uh, base things on, which gives you big questions and then questions within that. Uh, I'm gonna kind of assume that everyone's starting from zero earth chemistry content because uh, that's the way it is a lot. That means that uh, um, the courses all have to include a lot of basic things which are not specifically mentioned in NGSS in order to accomplish a PE. So you gotta build a foundation in order to get there. Um, uh, we'll also be making some new connections, material not in past chemistry courses certainly, and even not emphasized much in um, introductory geoscience courses. So we are kind of pull it together and come up with some new ways of looking at it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna go through a whole bunch pretty fast. Um, I'm not gonna use many of the links on the uh, PowerPoint because we don't have time but the links are there and I hope the PowerPoint will serve as a reference for anybody coming back to this. So uh, what we have to do um, is kind of look the, take the, the big picture here. Um, we've all seen uh, wood that's been processed for lumber, but we know the forest is the real source. Uh, we've go, I'll go to the grocery and we have all kinds of food that's been processed, but we know the farm is the real source. And probably everybody's got bottles of chemicals um, but when you look at the source, it's really the earth. And we're kind of trying to get to the idea that um, the earth is a big sphere of chemicals. Um, that's where it all comes from. It really is our source for our chemicals. It means, by the way, an interesting thought is uh, maybe you want to complete your chemical stock supply. You might add some uh, minerals and rocks because uh, there's some more chemicals. Okay, so if we're gonna uh, figure out uh, where is the chemicals in the earth, we need to kind of start with a foundation. Um, before we study the periodic table, which is often something that's uh, done very early in uh, chemistry courses, we can start asking, how did the first elements form? This relates to uh, ESS 1-2, uh, which is uh, about the Big Bang and on to composition of matter in the universe. Uh, so that's important to matter. Um, the major outcome of the Big Bang for chemistry courses is we start with a lot of hydrogen in the earliest universe. And here's a couple few uh, URLs that can help you with uh, nucleosynthesis and Big Bang information to build that. Uh, next step is uh, we, we got some of the lighter, got the lighter elements. How did we get the heavier elements? Uh, this relates to ESS 1.3, which is about how stars uh, over their life cycle produce elements. And then also relates to ESS 1.1, because again, it's about lifespan of the sun and how does fusion release energy and so forth. Um, I expect that uh, most chemistry teachers are already used to teaching nuclear fission and fusion. 
um, and it is in PS18. Uh, but our example now we can add is the stellar fusion in addition to anything that uh, humans do. <clears throat> a, um, a place to get some animations which show how the elements uh, form is the URL at the bottom. Some uh, screenshots from that uh, is uh, here's the situation you get in a uh, low mass star like the sun and how it builds up from one element to the next in layers. As you get heavier stars, you can go uh, farther and build up all the way to iron and see where those are coming from. And then the heavier elements above iron uh, form in supernova explosions uh, and the dust gets scattered through space. And eventually that uh, dust settles back in to uh, make a, a new solar system, the sun and planets. This really gets us to the next performance expectation, which is um, a, for the phenomenon is how did the elements come together to make the earth? And the performance expectation is ESS 1.6, uh, apply scientific reason and evidence to construct an account of the earth's formation and early history. So we have to get that one together as the next step. Um, a video I'll recommend, this one is actually from the Big History Project, a kind of science and history course that uh, starts at the Big Bang, goes to the future. This is a good video for discussing the early Earth, and you can find some others as well. Um, and once we get the uh, elements together, uh, uh, we now need to figure out, well, where are they in the interior of the Earth? Um, this our phenomenon is now not directly observable because we can't go into the interior of the Earth, but but our observable item is kind of the evidence. Um, this relates to ESS 2.3, develop a model based on evidence of the Earth's interior. So we have a bunch to do there, and we'll also talk about convection about it. Um, this really does make a nice coherent sequence to begin with the Big Bang and some uh, light elements. Stars make heavier ones. They come together to make the Earth. And then we're figuring out where are the materials of the Earth in the Earth, uh, where they distribute it. So, makes a really nice uh, sequence to add to building up to eventually the periodic table. Um, so what we're going to look for is some examples of evidence um, for uh, the chemistry and the conditions of matter, because this is a chemistry course we're working on uh, to develop the model of the Earth. So our first question, is the interior of the Earth homogeneous? Uh, our, we can look at uh, data as our phenomenon. We find that Density of the crust is 2.9 grams per cubic centimeter, but the whole Earth is 5.5. We can ask the question, what does this suggest? We hope the students would be able to figure out a claim evidence reasoning uh, version of describing what they can see from that um, and uh, probably con conclude that there are some materials in the interior of the Earth that are more dense. Okay, that's our first question. Look at some more data. Suppose we have element percentages uh, by weight. Uh, and now our phenomenon of our new data, what does this data suggest is going on? Um, again, claim evidence reason, get them to look at the data and figure out what, to come up with something that they can uh, conclude. <clears throat> Probably uh, that uh, the more dense out materials in the earth are iron, magnesium, and nickel from the data. So we're building up the model of what is the interior of the earth. But then we move on to some other evidence. Um, this is still part of uh, ESS 2.3 is beginning to look at the phenomenon of seismic waves and the way they act. Of course, waves also could be in physics, so, uh, or it could be split, could do it in both classes for different reasons. So um, all the PEs can get distributed differently. For seismic waves, what happens is if you have an earthquake, the waves can spread out um, throughout the earth. Uh, and two basic kinds of earthquake waves are P and S waves that we can look at. And you, and you have a good earthquake, those waves could go anywhere on the earth. But the real phenomenon is they don't. And so what's going on that would make that happen that's happening in the inside of the earth? Um, here's a cross section through the earth. Uh, shows uh, that we have, uh, if we have an earthquake up here at the top, we get P and S waves all the way to 105 degrees. But all the section down here in red, we don't get any S waves. And uh, down in here, this section, the sections in blue, you don't get uh, direct P waves, okay? And so the question now is, what could cause this kind of wave behavior? What's going on inside the Earth? Um, we hope that you could conclude it suggests something's blocking the S waves and changing the path of the P waves. But, but why? What can we learn about the uh, chemistry inside if we keep a little deeper? Well, we have to learn about the waves. P waves are longitudinal waves like this. Meanwhile, S waves are transverse waves. 
they go like this. And the way they move, this is going to require um, different uh, intermolecular forces. There's our chemistry link is we're looking at what do these forces, uh, how do they act uh, in carrying a wave or not? For an S wave, they have to be pretty well connected to get that transverse wave to go through, but uh, P waves require less connection. So we have differing materials will carry them. S waves don't travel in liquids. P waves can travel in solids or liquids. This begins to tell us about the inside of the earth. Also, all waves can refract, change direction when they cross the boundary between two different media. Um, physics uses lots of air to glass sort of uh, examples. Now we can add examples of changing media inside the earth of different densities and different materials. What can we conclude at this point? Um, what does the nature of PNS waves tell us about the internal earth? Okay, again, ask the students for a claim evidence reason. What can you figure out? Um, with uh, um, some thought, we hope they'll be able to see that the, there must be some area of liquid magma in the earth and that blocks the S waves so they don't get through. And there's probably uh, materials that are different that uh, bend the P waves and refract them in different directions. And, and that changes in materials is a matter of differing chemistry. Um, uh, when you get the final uh, diagram of what's going on inside the earth and how do the waves go, it looks like this. Um, it, uh, we wouldn't expect students to figure all this out, but what we do eventually see is there is a solid core here, but a liquid core outside of it. And that's what blocks our S waves. Um, and in general, the evidence shows us we have different states of matter inside the earth. There's our chemistry connection. We figured out a little more about the chemistry of the interior. Um, to help with some of these, uh, here are some sources of animations for the interior earth. Uh, a bunch of them are from IRIS, which is a good scientific source. Okay, that's some of these on shadow zones and some more about earth chemistry here in that animation. Uh, also, um, ESS 2.3 refers to 3D views of the interior Earth. Uh, that's seismic tomography. Here are some videos that will uh, give you some information on that as well. Um, <clears throat> once we've kind of figured out the layers are there, it goes back to the density facts that we started with um, and uh, for the interior of the Earth. Um, density in the Earth, um, really, uh, most chemistry folks will probably be doing experiments in the lab with small objects measuring their density. The study of the earth then expands that density to way beyond the, la the lab, and that's a really good extension. A, a problem with working in the interior of the earth is obviously we can't visit there. It's hard to do hands-on experiments with it. Um, a suggestion I'll make is you might want to try the uh, GeoBlocks paper models. Uh, here's the source. You can uh, fold them up and the students can uh, the students can make their own, start reading the information about them and, and have something to uh, look at if they, uh, instead of just working with the uh, talk. <clears throat> um, when you do get the structure finally of what is inside the earth, um, you do find that the density uh, is strong, biggest in the center and getting less as you go out. And when you even get out uh, past the earth, you get to the oceans at about one and the atmosphere at less than that. And uh, what you begin to see is the whole Earth system is arranged by density. So it's really an important uh, you know, characteristic and uh, worthy of thinking about beyond just uh, small objects. Um, uh, interestingly, the Earth itself it varies in density because of different compositions compared to the oceans and the atmosphere are very similar compositions uh, throughout, but their densities are changing some. Uh, but uh, we figured out the chemistry varies inside the Earth. So there's our chemistry connection. Um, the other part of 2.3 uh, is uh, mentions about convection. Uh, this begins to tie us to another topic that we need to talk about, which is plate tectonics. And so um, our question is, what can move the plates? Um, there's a bunch of different videos out there on convection. Um, if you take a look at them, here are a couple of them. Uh, you may find that you, the equipment's simple enough. You can do it as a demo yourself or uh, do it as a student lab, and you may already be doing that in uh, classes. So uh, convection comes in, and then uh, here's a video for how it occurs in the earth. Of course, it's uh, much slower. Uh, another point is that um, uh, ESS 2.3 uh, generally refers to convection mainly as the way that uh, tectonic plates move. There are also uh, other ways that plates are driven. This will give some more information to uh, complete that uh, discussion. And then we get to ESS21, which has a huge amount of stuff in it 
because it asks for developing a model of the Earth's internal and surface weathering processes. That's, so that's inside and out. And then it refers to continental and ocean floor geography. That's everywhere. So we've covered a whole lot there. Um, multiple subjects, and, and you have to start adding a bunch of background material to make this work. Okay? But um, that's, that's good, because it actually turns out to be some important stuff. Here's an example for starters. Here's a map of the Earth uh, with the uh, oceans removed, uh, drawn by elevations. You can see red is higher and green is lower. Yellow's in the middle. There's not so much yellow. There's a lot of red and green. And it shows the Earth has mainly two main elevations. Um, and the question is, and, and it really turns out to be important because uh, if we didn't have this higher land, the continents, uh, the whole Earth would be covered with water and we wouldn't have any dry land to live on. So this is an important question to figure out, how did this happen? How did we get this? Okay. It, it turns out that um, what causes it is differences in chemistry. And how did it come to be? Chemical differentiation. So uh, this is a chemistry uh, topic, quite relevant. And we'll, we'll see it as we uh, develop here. Um, students may need some help first with uh, what is the geography out there? What are the landforms uh, in uh, continents and oceans? Um, What's out there that we need to explain? A few places you might go for some uh, information. Uh, the geo inquiry exercises use uh, GIS as a way to examine data, and they also have some questions and exercises. Um, the national map will help you show, uh, look at landforms wherever you are in the United States. And then um, an interesting thing to realize is that your local geology is your local chemistry. It's the chemistry under your feet. And so what is the chemistry under your school and under your house and so forth? You can refer to geologic maps to begin to figure that out okay? and, and make it local. It's always great to uh, bring this home to a student so for where they are. And as you go through some of this, you'll end up being talking about some of the landforms and, and things that are there that we need to refer to in plate tectonics, which is useful. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the question is, if we start looking at chemistry under our feet, what are we going to find? Well, if we start looking at earth materials, um, elements come together to make compounds, and minerals are naturally occurring compounds. Um, here's a group of uh, compounds that probably chemistry teachers are using and have been using for uh, exercising on writing and balancing formulas and so forth. Um, they may not have been aware that um, all, all of these uh, compounds occur naturally. And even before we knew what their chemistry was, we knew their uh, characteristics and we gave them a name based on uh, gave them mineral names. So um, a lot of the compounds that teachers have been working with for a long time are actually naturally occurring compounds. However, these kind of compounds are, are kind of uh, uh, not very much of the earth. 90% of the crust of the earth are silicate minerals, which these are not. So if you make a pie chart of it, uh, these compounds over here make up this gray section. Uh, but then the rest of the pie chart is uh, plagioclase, sodium feldspar, or I'm sorry, potassium feldspar, quartz, pyroxene, amphibole, micas, clays, and a whole bunch of other silicates. So we have uh, a whole bunch of other things that are, make up 90% of the chemicals under our feet. It would be really good relevant chemistry to include these. Um, here's some, uh, here's the formulas written for these, uh, for uh, those, those common minerals. Uh, we hope that, uh, well, we notice right away that these are kind of complicated. So it's one of the reasons they haven't been in chemistry before. But uh, so how can we include them? Um, what we probably need to do is generalize them some. We could get students to take a look through them and, and all of them except calcite down here at the bottom. They all have silica, they all have oxygen. The oxygen subscripts tend to be kind of large, okay? And, and then there's uh, metal ions after that. So we can just not worry about all of those individual compounds too much, but uh, realize that they are silicates, silicon plus oxygen plus a metal. Oh yeah, or our carbonate down here at the bottom, which is uh, also pretty, um, pretty relevant. So uh, if you go back and look at what, what is the element abundance as a result of that, okay? And can the students maybe hopefully figure out that what's gonna be number one, it's gonna be that oxygen because it has that large, all those large subscripts. Um, here's the beginning of something that's a little counterintuitive. Most of the uh, oxygen is in the earth, is in the rocks, not in the air, okay? <clears throat> and then also uh, what's gonna be number two, 
has to be silicon because it's because we got that combination and then we have all of the uh, metal ions after that and particularly with this big volume number up here you get this very counterintuitive results the rocks that we walk on uh, crust and mantle they're a sea of oxygen atoms with the metal ions mixed in over here uh, so here's something kind of different about what is the chemistry of the earth and um, they kind of ask, okay, why do we get, uh, why does the oxygen take up so much space? The chemistry teachers are probably already doing electronegativity differences in order to find, uh, are they ionic or covalent? Silicon and oxygen is 1.76, that means it's mostly ionic. Um, so the oxygen takes the electrons and gets bigger, uh, leaves the silicon smaller in the middle. Uh, if you start looking at them as, as this kind of shows the inside, here's our real volume and the way it comes out. And then we can uh, represent this as a, a three-sided pyramid, as a tetrahedron. Um, if you look at the shapes that minerals form with the tetrahedrons, you get isolated ones, rings, single change, double change, sheets, frameworks, a whole bunch of different structures. This may remind uh, chemistry teachers of what happens with uh, carbon, with organic molecules. Um, a good question then becomes, uh, why would these be in, uh, act in similar ways? Um, easy answer, go look at the periodic table. Carbon and silicon are in the same column, right un silicon right underneath carbon. And so they're in the same family. We would expect them to act in similar ways. Um, this makes a nice um, connection uh, between organic chemistry that teachers are probably doing and also the inorganic parts of chemistry and seeing that uh, these two uh, elements play key roles in each one of those. Uh, okay, so then the uh, minerals uh, get turn into mixtures as rocks. Okay. <clears throat> for our study for rocks, uh, for chemistry, we can divide them into granitic versus basaltic and look at their characteristics. Uh, they're different in their relative amount of silica, higher and lower, what metal elements do they have, color, uh, density is gonna be important, and uh, melting point is also another piece that turns out to be important. And so we kind of follow, what are these main groups of rocks? Um, important item for here is the, the beginning uh, recognition that rock is not just a rock. They're all different. They behave differently. They're not all the same. And hopefully this will be a little eye-opening because a lot of rocks get taken for granted, as it were. Um, if you uh, look at uh, where are these uh, main compositions in the crust, okay, um, uh, this is a diagram uh, of the upper uh, part of the earth. The mantle down here, these layers are more dense than the crust but we do have a layer in the, the asthenosphere, which is a little bit deformable. The granitic crust in general is thicker and less dense, while the basaltic crust is thinner and more dense. So uh, the more dense one floats lower, settles into this asthenosphere some, and the granitic crust floats higher. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the chemical difference between these two is what causes that two major elevation areas on the earth, um, differences in these two chemistries. Um, then what happens is it rains on the continent. Uh, the water flows off the high land and collects in the lower section, which is over the basaltic crust. That means that's where the oceans are. And so uh, that gives us our, our other names. This, the basaltic crust is oceanic crust and the, the granitic crust is continental. So we connect, where do we find these? And, but we can also see why are they there? Why, why are they the uh, elevations that they are? Well, another phenomenon that ends up relating to this, uh, we find some volcanoes explode while others don't. And the question is, why is this, okay? Um, we're uh, seeing lots of this uh, basaltic magma come out of Hawaii right now. Uh, and um, it turns out it's rather low in silica that makes it kind of relatively runny for a magma. So it, instead of uh, trapping gas, it just lets the gas shoot out, okay? And it runs off. Uh, as long as you're a reasonable distance away and watching what's going on, you can it's safe to watch it. On the other hand, we have volcanoes that are granitic magma. They have a lot of silica in them that makes a lot of intermolecular forces uh, in, in, inside those, between the molecules, uh, makes it very viscous, makes it thick. It traps gas until it finally explodes, okay? And so uh, the difference between the chemistries here is life and death. And you're probably looking for important, well, why should we study chemistry? Well, here it is. It's life and death also controls uh, the shape of the volcano and other things. But notice we've now gotten these two magmas, one's basaltic and one's granitic. 
how did the earth separate these? Why do we get these two things in different places? Well, this is a chemical differentiation process. That's what we also need to talk about. Um, that gets us to the, um, uh, adds uh, chemical processes to plate tectonics. We're kind of used to plate tectonics being about uh, moving pieces of uh, continents around and so forth, but we can also begin to talk about it as a, a chemical process as well. In order to do that, you do have to understand the mechanisms of plate tectonics. So here is a, a place to put in uh, the main, the, the, the big uh, topic of uh, geosciences and, and the unifying topic of, of unit, uh, geosciences, plate tectonics. It, it will fit here and talk about its chemistry. Um, the chemistry students will need to understand what are those mechanisms. Um, here is a resource, the plate tectonics in a nutshell is a, a easy place to get a good summary of plate tectonics of what's going on. Um, there are uh, multiple lessons in the GIS geo inquiries if you want to use those. And another uh, way if you want to get to the hands-on stuff, you can uh, take the geo blocks plate tectonics segment, uh, apply, assign each group of students a, a block to uh, figure out what's going on and explain it to the rest of the class. In that process, you'd end up talking about all the different mechanisms that go on. So there's ways to get students uh, studying the plate tectonics itself. And then move on to what's the chemistry. In order to talk about the chemistry, uh, I'm gonna use an analogy of uh, when we people need to get materials from the earth, we need to chemically refine them often, take, them, take an ore and then refine it. So we need to separate them. So uh, what do we do? Um, we're gonna separate and concentrate materials um, for oil and gas uh, refineries, uh, what they do is take the crude oil, heat it up so it's all vapor, uh, let it go through a tower that has uh, plates at different temperatures, and in that way they separate all the fractions over here, gasoline, kerosene, and so forth. So they're separating every, uh, the parts by the chemical uh, characteristic of condensation point. There's one example. If you have iron ores, uh, you take a blast furnace, you dump everything in the top of the blast furnace, you heat it all up and you let density settle out the iron ore down here at the bottom, okay? So you're separating by density. So these are two examples of how we refine materials using their chemical properties. That's the same thing that happens in the earth as it turns out, okay? That happens in plate tectonics. Um, here is a view from the plate tectonics in, in a nutshell of, of the general mechanisms and the descriptions of these, uh, all the numbered spots are in that description. Here's what's going on in plate tectonics. Um, fundamentally, um, over time, as uh, magma and, and materials move from down here in the mantle to make uh, oceanic crust, then the oceanic crust becomes subducted down this way and it partially melts here and it partially solidifies up here. As it does this process, this removes the denser fractions uh, and changes the chemistry as it's going through this process. That is what gives us our less dense granitic crust over here that floats high on the mantle, while our more dense basaltic crust forms over here um, and floats lower. And as mentioned earlier, then it rains and the water flows off into the ocean and covers the uh, now oceanic crust, okay? Uh, but it is the um, chemical refinery action of this plate tectonics motion that gives us the continents that we need to live on gives us the um, less dense material granitic stuff. So uh, here is uh, what's going on and how plate tectonics can act also as a chemical refinery. In addition to that, it's also what affects those uh, volcano magmas uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a diagram of compositions of the major igneous rocks. You can see minerals up here uh, based on their percentages. Um, <clears throat> and then the uh, names that go with each one of them down here. Um, in that refinery reaction that we just looked at, uh, it moves from, uh, takes basalt and gradually turns it into a, a granite composition. Um, in this chart, we can also see what does that do to the amount of silica? It starts at uh, a relatively uh, low percentage here and goes higher. So basalt is in the say 40s and 50s percent, but granite is in the 60s and 70s percentages. It's that higher amount of silica gives us uh, more intermolecular forces in granitic magmas, and that's what can hold the magma together until it builds up pressure and explodes. So this uh, refinery action gives us the two different kinds of magma. Um, it's also worth noting down here for potassium and sodium. 
as this refinery action moves from uh, right to left here, uh, it increases the amount of potassium and sodium, and um, all plant and animal life need those to live. So it's a really good thing this refinery action is happening, gives us more uh, nutrients available. Um, also, um, another item that happens because of these density differences that come up, the phenomenon which is in uh, ESS 1.5, it says uh, look at past and current movements of continental crust uh, to explain the ages of crustal rocks. Okay, so what the question we're asking is, um, uh, the oldest rocks turn out to be continental crust while the ocean crust is younger. Why is that? Okay, um, here's some data to look at to see the ages. The, uh, these maps will give you seafloor ages. This one will give you continental rocks. Uh, the students should be able to realize that, okay, continental rocks can be billions of years old. The oldest ocean crust is only 200 to 300 million years old, relatively young. Um, and the cause is because at, when the plates get pushed under each other at subduction zone, the more dense basaltic oceanic crust is pushed under the less dense granitic one. And so the granitic one keeps floating around while the ocean crust can disappear. Uh, that's why the ocean, the continental crust is always, is generally older. And it's all due to chemistry, differences in the density um, uh, and all of the chemical refinery action of plate tectonics gives us the earth we see. Oh, okay, so that's the internal processes. Um, uh, we're still working on uh, uh, 2.1 and we need to talk about surface processes. A phenomenon we can see is that mountains get pushed up but then little by little they wear away and we gotta figure out, okay, what's going on there? Um, this also begins to touch on ESS 2.5, which is about the properties of water and its effects on materials and surface processes. Um, what happens is uh, minerals and rocks break down in weathering. It can be both physical weathering and chemical weathering, but uh, physical aspects of material and chemical aspects are both matter. So. Uh, this is still about chemistry. What's going on to make these rocks break down? Um, some examples of chemical weathering types will probably expand some of the reactions that uh, chemistry teachers have to talk about. Um, they might already include that uh, when rainwater falls through the air, it picks up some carbon dioxide, uh, making a weak solution of carbonic acid. Um, when that um, hits uh, limestone or marble, it begins to dissolve the calcite that's in there, the calcium carbonate, uh, producing ions that are dissolved in water. These can just flow away, and so our rock is uh, washed away in the rainwater. That breaks down the rock. This can, uh, over time, take out a lot of uh, material. Uh, another example is oxidation. Iron and oxygen give you the mineral hematite here, um, and um, that's one that probably people are already doing, but also seeing this is a natural one that happens in the earth. Uh, another group is the hydrolysis reactions, uh, reactions with water. If you take potassium feldspar uh, and it will eventually uh, weather into clay, here's where we get clay minerals, um, but it also releases the potassium as uh, ions in solution. If this was a sodium or calcium uh, plagioclase feldspar, then you'd get sodium or calcium ions released. And the other thing that happens with hydrolysis is similar to the oxidation. Uh, if you have an iron bearing silicate um, with oxygen and water, you'll get um, a limonite as a different iron oxide from the ones above. Limonite's a uh, rusty uh, brown uh, mineral. You uh, combine it with our other weathering product, clay, and you end up with brown soil. Uh, then put all the uh, biological material in, and that's how you get all of our soils. Uh, but um, importantly, if these uh, weathering reactions didn't occur, we wouldn't have some of these potassium, sodium, calcium ions to use for life. And no life would exist unless these weathering reactions uh, release the elements from the rocks. So these are very important vital chemical reactions going on. Um, another thing that chemistry teachers talk about, uh, they will touch on chemical, uh, what, what affects reaction rates. Um, uh, after looking at these for weathering, we hope that they could give an example of uh, how this applies to uh, weathering reactions. So for example, um, uh, water is needed for a number of those reactions we just looked at, and um, especially wet the climate will make a difference uh, whether how the rocks will uh, weather and how fast. Um, different minerals weather faster than others. 
Um, quartz is always slow to weather. It's, uh, it's in the chemical nature of how much do they break down. Uh, temperature makes a difference. Uh, warm climates always show uh, more and faster weathering. Um, the chem physical weathering tends to break down uh, materials into smaller pieces. That increases their relative surface area, uh, just like uh, powdering a chemical or crushing it. So that speeds up the chemical weathering. So this is important. And concentration of reactions matter. An example of adding more and more carbon dioxide added into groundwater makes the acid a little more, uh, a little stronger and dissolves uh, more rock and, and dissolves out ions like iron. So all of these chemical reaction rate uh, factors that chemistry teachers are already talking about will also apply to uh, weathering and can be brought into that discussion. Um, then uh, we can hopefully make this local. Um, the chemical weathering has been going on outside if, to make your local landforms. So for example, if you're in a wet climate, if you have limestones or marbles, uh, they will generally dissolve away and make valleys. You can look around at your geology and your landforms and see, do those correlate? Where do you find the limestones and marbles? Does it make valleys? But on the other hand, if you live in a dry climate, it's going to make a cliff because you really need the water in order to uh, wear away the uh, calcite. So this begins to have an effect on your landforms. Uh, feldspar is kind of fairly easily weathered to clay as long as there's some uh, water around. Um, so you get a covering of soil and you can see how much of that is there. Uh, meanwhile, quartz, um, very hard, um, doesn't, uh, wear, doesn't react chemically uh, very fast at all. So any rock with quartz weathers rather slowly. And so you can look and see, have you got sandstones or quartzites in certain places in your, uh, in your area? And they are probably going to be the high places. Uh, so uh, that affects your landforms. And also, if you happen to be in a place that has a, a lot of sand, um, quartz is usually what's left after everything else is weathered out. And so that collection of sand is, uh, will be largely quartz in many places. But all sand is different. That's another item to do. It's another aspect of looking at uh, earth materials. Collect some sand, take a look under, at it under a microscope, see what's in it, okay? Different chemistries. Um, and so you kind of begin to see that, uh, that the landforms of your area are like, if I, I'm gonna run an experiment, not for you know, a day or a week, I'm gonna run it for millions of years. I'm gonna put this stuff outside. Let's see what happens to it after a very long time. Uh, <clears throat> and so there's a long-term chemical experiment that you drive over on your way to school or your way to work every day. <clears throat> That's a lot of the uh, performance expectations that I can kind of see as in chemistry. Um, different schools will put them in, in different places. Um, some other uh, performance expectations that might fall into chemistry, um, ESS 2.6 is on the carbon cycle. Um, <clears throat> you might put that one in biology because obviously carbon is related there. You could also include it with climate change discussions. Um, but in any case, uh, when you're looking at it, uh, important item to add and notice in your carbon cycle is the uh, biggest reservoir is in the earth and uh, getting carbon out of the earth and back into the earth is the long-term cycle different from the metabolism and, uh, and photosynthesis cycles, which go a lot faster. Um, <clears throat> if you need some, uh, this uh, does ask for a quantitative model. So here are a couple of carbon cycles that have numbers that you uh, may have found, but here's some if you need them. Um, the other thing to notice is the carbon cycle is one of the biogeochemical cycles. Um, those kind of cycles haven't been in chemistry very much, even though they have the, but there's the word chemical in it. So um, they can be an, an important item to do, to do the nitrogen cycle and the sulfur cycle and those sorts of things in chemistry as well. And then they end up relating to the biology and the geology and so forth. They can really be a good theme for uh, tying together a bunch of courses. Um, there are a number of performance expectations that are on resources. Um, 3.1 is about availability of natural resources. 3.2 is on um, uh, developing them and looking at cost-benefit ratios. And 3.3 is about uh, simulation regarding uh, natural resources. Um, <clears throat> all of those natural resources are chemicals, so this could be in a chemistry uh, class. A lot more open-ended uh, questions here, uh, which is why these are pretty challenging uh, performance expectations. Um, I don't have time and, and I've looked for some uh, information on these and found some. 
Uh, I think this is a spot where we can uh, hopefully uh, gather more information on these, uh, since, especially since they're much more open-ended questions. Uh, so hopefully we'll build on these, but they could be in chemistry. Then we get to climate change. Uh, that one's connected to all of the science subjects. Uh, so uh, ESS 3.5 could be in chemistry uh, or other places, um, but we're looking for uh, what's the evidence for a uh, forecast of the current rate of climate change and so forth. Um, uh, what we're looking at here is the emphasis would be uh, how if we're changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere and then the ocean chemical composition is changing as well. What are the results of that? What do we think is going on there? So the chemistry of this can be emphasized. Um, good many sources of data for educational uh, information on uh, climate change. Um, uh, I've also found uh, this last one, the NAP.edu one, is a, uh, a PDF uh, of cha climate change evidence and causes a good scientific source with a good bit of data in it as well that can be applied to a lot of uh, climate change uh, studies. Um, so uh, in kind of uh, conclusion here, we're, we've made lots of chemistry connections. We have a lot of topics here that are already in chemistry courses all over, okay? and now we're kind of expanding them, enhancing them um, from uh, elements. How, do they, how are they made? Let's start at the very beginning. We have compounds that we talk about. Let's talk about the naturally occurring ones and rocks as mixtures. Okay, So we broaden our view of what we're looking at. Density turns out to be important in the Earth's layers and in separating continental and oceanic crust. Uh, intermolecular forces are important discussion in chemistry. Well, that affects the way seismic waves travel, and it affects the way uh, lava uh, acts around a volcano. We've added some more uh, weathering reactions, even some one more that are needed for life. Uh, maybe already talking about convection, now add it in the bigger scale in the Earth. Uh, we found that reaction rate factors all apply to chemical weathering as well. And we really like the kids to walk away out of the chemistry course realizing the chemistry is all around them. And so now that includes seeing that the Earth as being chemically reactive and even beginning to talk about really the chemical evolution of the Earth and seeing uh, that process uh, going on. Um, there are some new topics for chemistry, perhaps, but uh, maybe they've been there. Um, maybe they've had been able to talk about human refining of resources. Um, we can talk about uh, refining in general and how plate tectonics does that, and then perhaps managing earth resources uh, as chemical materials. Um, make chemistry local. What's the chemistry under your feet? Um, a lot of it is silicates, and the silicates really need to be added to chemistry because they've been left out for a long time. And also, what's the rock under your school? What's your uh, local chemistry? Then realizing you can do, uh, uh, the Earth has been doing long-term experiments, um, having stuff out for weathering for uh, millions of years worth of chemistry. And so it makes a, a, really, a really long lab and you can go see what the results are. Um, so <clears throat> I'm hoping, we're looking forward to chemistry teachers uh, enjoying some of this uh, nifty chemistry of the Earth and uh, having a good time teaching it because uh, there's uh, lots of cool chemistry out there. Uh, and <clears throat> I hope uh, some of this uh, stuff has been helpful and uh, brought in a few new ideas. And I'm happy to discuss uh, what other questions and comments people have. Great, Martin, thanks. That was a, a whirlwind tour. I felt like I was going through an entire year of, of teaching an earth science or a geology course and thinking about it from the viewpoint of how a chemist might see it. So that was wonderful. Um, just checking back through the, the chat box here, um, there were a couple of comments along the way that uh, people were feeling like these were great topics to build a problem-based learning activity around at several points. Have you had experience with, with doing that or with teachers doing that? Um, um, not very much yet because all of this is, is with, we're right at the point where people are just writing the new uh, curricula for it. Um, it. We really have to kind of move a little more towards the uh, phenomenon, uh, but um, you can see the beginnings of it there with uh, here's some of the data, uh, take the data and let's see what the students can uh, observe from it. Um, uh, maybe start from some big questions and work your way down. I have not had a lot of experience with it because we're really at the process of just beginning this stuff, but I hope I was hoping I could share this much as to how far along we are. Great. Okay. Another, another question, there were a couple of, of uh, 
books and uh, YouTube resources that were popping up in the chat. So I encourage people to skim back through their, their chat there to take a look at that. Um, another question about uh, the chemical evolution of the earth and thinking about banded iron formations uh, and wondering if you know of resources for how the composition of earth's geosphere has changed over time. Uh, okay, I, I did not have it in uh, in the PowerPoint. Um, there is uh, a um, a tool uh, from HHMI called EarthView, uh, and it takes a really long view of the Earth and has graphs of uh, how much oxygen was in the atmosphere at different points, which then um, uh, has to do with uh, the banded iron and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. So, the worldview application from HHMI can be uh, really helpful for looking at the long-term evolution of the Earth. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so that, that's HHMI, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Correct. Okay, yeah. And, it's, uh, and Worldview is a, a down, free downloadable uh, program. Uh, it originally was out for uh, things like iPads, but it also can run on computers now um, and gives you the kind of the long view of what's happened in the Earth. Good suggestion. And um, we want to make sure that everyone knows that the slides are available as well as the archived version, um, recorded version of this webinar will be up shortly. So you can definitely come back here and click on links and go to all those wonderful resources that Martin has made available to us. Um, yeah, that was a purpose. It's, so that's great. It's not enough time to do everything. So uh, hopefully <laughs> people can look at the links. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Okay. Um, Last questions, if you want to put those into the chat, um, we're going to talk a little bit here about the discussion forum that's available. So John, do you want to pop up to the here you go. I'll next do this. slide? I guess, Martin, you have to unshare your screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there is uh, an opportunity to join us on the threaded discussion afterwards. And just a note for, for those of you that might be new to uh, the CERC pages, in order to join the threaded discussion, you have to have a CERC account, which is very easy to create, and you have to be signed into that account. So the easy way to do that is to go to nagt.org, and in the very top right-hand corner where it says my account, you can click there, and that will uh, prompt you to make that account or to sign in. Um, and then once you're signed in and you're on the page, uh, there's an opportunity to sign up for new uh, for notifications of any new posts on that threaded discussion. So please make sure that you're uh, you're doing those two things. And we do have two prompts that are up. If you want to jump to the next slide, John. The two prompts that are up right now, and of course we encourage you to to create your own prompt and start your own thread in the discussion. But what we thought would be valuable for the community as a start was. Um, what is your school system found as a good distribution of the NGSS high school ESS performance expectations into biology, chemistry, and physics? And starting from that distribution, how are you writing new curricula for NGSS? And then also, what approaches have you found effective to help the other teachers and starting to enjoy the earth and space science aspects of their classes as they're integrating them in? So we'd love to hear from uh, those of you on the webinar or those of you that are watching this webinar as a recording about your uh, your thoughts on those so please join us there uh, martin any last little comments you want to toss in before we uh we wrap this up uh no uh, but I, I i think it's just uh, i hope that uh, the chemistry teachers will uh, see we got some uh, really interesting chemistry here and 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 relevant and I think there's really some good additions to chemistry courses that kind of help round them out and help students see uh, uh, what's going on around them. Okay. Oh, one final question this, that just came in, um, and thanks for asking this. Where would you recommend teachers get more content knowledge for earth and space science connections? Um, uh, it, it's a tough one. This is something that I think that um, NAGT and, and, and ESDA and those can, can help write. I mean, we kind of need... Um, uh, to help teachers that, that I've worked with, I kind of had a kind of wrote a chapter of introduction to uh, chemistry of the earth. Um, a, a lot of that was in the uh, the PowerPoint here. A lot of the basics of it, um, but but yes, this is, that's material that probably needs to get uh, developed uh, to help people with more things. Like you can you can find some of it out there on the internet, 
but uh, this is new. It's a new approach. Uh, so uh, I, I hope what I've presented is, is a start and maybe uh, the organizations start working together to see how can we pull this kind of information together to uh, help schools across the country. Right. I, I would add to that comment that uh, over the past year or so, we've done a number of um, webinars that have covered uh, opportunities to have access to resources and information. So um, go back and look at the archived versions of webinars in this series. And I think you'll find quite a bit of great information there that will help teachers feel more comfortable in, uh, in talking about and integrating the earth and space science uh, concepts into their courses. So take a look back through some of those too. Okay, um, I wanna thank Martin Schmidt for joining us today. Um, great webinar and thanks for providing all the links and, and resources to everybody. I also wanna thank uh, those other collaborators on this webinar series, Ed Roback from AGI, Carla McAuliffe, Executive Director of Nesta, and John McDerris from NAGT CERC. Uh, so thanks for joining us all today and hope you enjoyed the webinar and look forward to seeing you in September. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye.